High on the Tibetan plateau, Chiru's roam free, oblivious to the tapestry of danger, steadily weaving up to their highlands. Fayaz lives in Srinagar, Kashmir, India's northernmost frontier. Fayaz's is a family of master weavers, once famed as makers of shatush shawls. They were elite among Kashmiri weavers. Known for their highly evolved skill and nimble craft honed over six centuries. Though Shatush is known to have travelled along the Silk Route between Central Asia and the Middle East, it was used mostly as warm lining in clothing. It is only in Kashmir that the weaving community evolved a process to transform this wool into a fabric as fine as art. Shatush is Persian for the king of wool. Its extraordinary fibre is just one-fifth the width of human hair. Shatush shawls are among the finest in the world, celebrated for its delicate featherlight crafting, softness and incredible warmth. For several hundred years, these luxury shawls were sought by aristocrats and handed down generations as inheritance. Till the late 1980s, Shatu shawls continued to be a status symbol not only in high society India but increasingly across the world. Priced between $800 to $5,000 in India, these shawls have been known to fetch up to $17,600 in the international market. But where did this magic fibre come from? What was the real story? Tibetan antelopes, or chiru, are found only on the Tibetan plateau, extending partly into a small area of Ladakh in India. The average altitude here is about 4,500 meters, and winter temperatures can dip to minus 40 degrees centigrade. These animals, related to the sheep family, have a thick underfleece which helps them adapt to the extreme cold. It is this undercoat that the world was after. In the early 1990s, renowned wildlife biologist George Schaller confirmed the gruesome link between the fleece of the chiru and this wonder yarn. At the time, up to 20,000 were found slaughtered on remote Tibetan slopes. For every 150 grams of wool, three chirus were killed. From 65,000 in the 1990s, the chiru's survival was now precarious.
In 2000, a four-member team from the Wildlife Trust of India did an undercover investigation in Tibet. Along the way, we started getting evidence of uh, a very large-scale trade in Shatush that was happening in Tibet and moving out of, say, places like Gertse, where we found huge caches of uh, skins lying in people's uh, backyards. Shatush fleece was available for sale even for regular travelers. So when we moved into Tagla Court, for example, we found a couple of traders there who were willing to send us, what, about 100 kgs a month or 200 kgs a month, maybe more than that, if we want it easily. A lot of um, uh, skins coming in from India to, to Tibet, for example, otter skins were going in there and we could see in a huge market skins being sold. So there was a fairly close link, uh, uh, sort of an illegal trade link that was, uh, you know, between the two countries that had been probably on for centuries. In April 2001, Chinese forestry police confiscated over 20,756 Chiru pelts. In August 2001, I4 and WTI released their report and campaign, wrap up the trade. It is only in 2002 that a conclusive ban was imposed on the international Shatush trade, despite a law being in place since 1976. This ban now included a focused legislation in Jammu and Kashmir. While this ban was critical for the survival of the Chiru, it spelled disaster for the Shatush workers of Kashmir. Shatush wool traditionally found its way to Kashmir across thousands of kilometers. Vast amounts continue to be routed surreptitiously through Nepal and Delhi. Traders weigh this wool and give it to skilled separators who clean it in their homes and earn rupees 50 for about 50 grams cleaned in a day. <laughs> The cleaned wool is then hand spun into yarn, knotted in clusters of 10, 9 inch threads. Spinners are paid 1 rupee per knot. These workers do not have to pay traders for the wool they work and are instead paid well for their skill. Backbone is straight, ki mani jate, shatos, usme, uh, se almost double wages. Milte thi. So overall, the artisans, artisans jo the, unki conditions kharaab se kharaab hone lagi. Thousands of people are involved in different aspects of this delicate home-based craft. Women, many of them conflict widows, form a large part of this workforce. With the ban, families dependent on these incomes are worst hit. At 70, Zubeda now struggles to keep her family afloat. Nafi is part of the Katan, the Hui was Pelagan at Katas, Subastadias Hatropiziana. I got some to us all to us, dear. At his Jans and Zahati, Trahati to.
It soon became clear that for the band to be genuinely successful, the livelihood of thousands of these people needed to be secured. To assess the situation on the ground, WTI and I4 launched a survey in the valley. Fayaz's family had urged him to stay away from this doomed trade. But he was among the first to be a part of the survey. I was doing a job, so I left it and I thought that I would be able to do something for this medium in the community. The survey findings brought some clarity to the situation of the Shatush workers. It was a home-based industry where all members of the family were involved in separate processes. There were about 15,000 people directly involved. Women were the largest segment and widows were worst hit. 60% of these workers wanted to shift to Pashmina. Pashmina earnings were one-third that of Shatush. Good Pashmina then offer an alternate livelihood for displaced Shatush workers. Pashmina wool is combed off mountain goats that are farm bred. This wool comes in many grades. The finest Pashmina at 10 microns is almost comparable to Shatush fiber. Original Kashmiri Pashmina shawls are meticulously handcrafted from this soft wool in a process similar to Shatush. However, there were a few hurdles in the transition from Shatush to Pashmina employment. The earnings from Pashmina were much less than from Shatush. If we Shatush, we could do monthly thousands of dollars a month, if a skillful person. With more artisans available, traders had the upper hand and could push the poultry wages down further. There is a very strong manufacturer and a trader lobby which actually ultimately makes the most profit out of this enterprise. And they are not interested in raising um, wages or raising or, or letting the profits go to the, to the workers. Also, with pashmina wool being much stronger and thicker, many of the famed hand processes were losing out to machines. Production centers churning imitations outside Kashmir had invaded the threshold of this Kashmiri craft, making hundreds of talented workers redundant. guarantee <laughs> So the answer therefore lay in reviving the traditional skills, in reviving the traditional techniques, which would then be able to give the people jobs and be able to command higher prices because Kashmir has very special skills. It is with this aim that I-4 and WTI, supported by the British High Commission, brought in their interventions to conserve the Chiro and simultaneously backward integrate and preserve the livelihoods of these traditional weavers. A key group of weavers was networked to form the Kashmir Handmade Pashmina Promotion Trust. Through this, the workers themselves would now control the production and share the profit. This body would also guarantee 100% Pashmina, both in material sourcing and its handcrafting. The other strategic thrust was to promote and personify Pashmina as a globally recognized geographical brand. 
and that is why we went ahead to make the uh, geographical indication of origin brand which would be like champagne or darjeeling tea which has a unique uh, flavor to a location the initial years were a challenge to convince artisans to come on board and adopt the ideas thrown up by the project the shift from shatush to pashmina was not smooth the drop in earnings was drastic and workers were insecure about moving on from familiar ground unlike shatush where they were given the wool at no cost in pashmina workers had to pay traders up front for the wool they were therefore skeptical of investing money in pashmina and also of becoming collective producers it took 3 years of consistent groundwork and dialogue to get it started Two years on, the project has started to take shape. Each step of the production process is checked for quality, right from the raw wool to the final product. Today, over 2,000 workers are a part of this effort. The project offers higher wages than the average market rate. The trust has now created its own brand of pashmina shawls, Pashma. Pashma is the only brand which guarantees 100% not only the purity of the wool used but also that the product is handcrafted. This has earned it the exclusive craftmark certification in 2006 pashma shawls were displayed and sold for the first time at the showcase handicraft bazaar delhi hat in new delhi artisans ko saath le gaye to artisans bhi ne bhi dekha ki traditional pashmina ki demand hai uske customers hain aur wo achhi price bhi dene mein unko koi sankoch nahi hai आर्टिजन लेवल पर एक कॉन्फिडेंस बन गया है कि अगर हम अपना पहला वाला जो ट्रेडिशनल काम है वो करें तो हमें इसमें इनकम भी बढ़ जाएगी और हमारा काम भी बढ़ जाएगा दिस वॉज फॉलोड बाई अनदर एग्जिबिशन एंड सेल इन डिसम्बर टू थाउजेंड एंड सेवन पाशमा कंजर्विंग दोप शुड नॉट है अल्टीमेटली मेंट डिस्ट्रॉइंग a 600 year old heritage here is a case where the ifa motto a better world for animals and people can be truly personified here is a case where the law is very strongly for the protection of the the animal but at the same time there is a a very good product a very good possibility a very good alternative livelihood available and i think this is the essence of pashma the brand we are trying to establish with pashma shawls now positioned as a benchmark there is finally hope for both the chiru and for the heritage weavers of kashmir hum ek better product de rahe hain jo pure hai real hai aur traditional hai to isko agar hum workers ke liye banaye to ye ek डिस्टेंट ड्रीम लगता है लेकिन हम डेफिनेटली इसको अचीव कर लेंगे द माउंटेन्स एंड द वैली मे नाउ हैव अ रियल चांस ऑफ इक्विलिब्रियम बिटवीन कॉन्जर्वेशन एंड लाइवलीहुड